live good morning rabbi brian right here it says so that's how i know and i have people who are already waving i haven't spotlit you guys yet but here we go we'll spotlight all of you there's the people hello people everyone wave to each other and do me the favor on this christmas eve cold 24th of december look up look around make it look like you're seeing the people in the other boxes around you it <laughs> it am, it amuses me um <laughs> And hopefully anyone who's watching on YouTube and Facebook, you guys are all invited to join us here in this room if you uh, join at ROTB.org. If it's your first time here or, oh my goodness, it could be past your hundredth time as we've been doing this for over two years, gathering on Saturday mornings. And this is a different type of uh, spiritual religious service and gathering. Um, and I asked people, we already had a... a a rogue microphone um but i do love for people's microphones to be unmuted so that we can hear each other we can interact with each other and i'd like to go over a little bit of uh zoom ground rules i'm going to change the screen so we can all see each other for a moment again um if you really like what someone's saying just you know give a thumbs up while they're talking so we can know or give them a an applause or something a little more visual so let's practice that. Let's say I said something that was awesome, which could happen. Yeah, let's see a little bit of, of interacting with each other. Something that's heartfelt, you might put your hands up over your heart so that we know that. Um, if something is feeling totally uh, annoying, you might flip the bird. Um, I'm not going to demonstrate that one. Um, but to, yeah, this, to, mean, this means amen for me. It means amen. Something just so that we we can be a little bit more interactive without it all having to be audio. Um, I'm going to go back to the screen here. And I have a... Uh, hold on one second. I'm going to welcome you all. I'm going to review us what we talked about last week. And if you would like to, if you go to this link, uh, uh, bit.ly dot bit slash l y r o t b written out three times in a row oh i was trying to make it more legible and i made it worse <laughs> <laughs> oh well um oh well a second let me i'll try that again there we go if you go to r o t b o b i t slash b i t dot l y slash r o t b in caps three times in a row you'll get to this Uh, and keep track of what we're doing. This is uh, something something a little bit new. It is Christmas Eve day today, and I wanted to um, I wanted to start by telling you guys a story. Oh, first before we do that, is there any review we need to talk about from last week? Something that came up at last week's service that you've been thinking about that's been burning a hole in your head that you want to bring up quickly is there something else that that is completely on your mind that you 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 need to share with this community before i launch into a story of eric and pam no okay so i'm going to tell you guys um i want to tell you guys a story that my friend eric eric and pam visited um north northern vietnam and Eric and Pam, they went on an elephant ride. They went to a remote village. And they told me this story um, that the people in the remote village talked about. And it was just a it was a, a basic theology story. And it was really kind of neat. And the story goes like this. Uh, in northern Thailand, these uh, people believe that there's this problem. There's this problem endemic in humanity, <clears throat> which is that time only flows in one direction. And sometimes we make mistakes, we make errors. And as much as you can try to go back to fix the error, you can't really ever fix the, you, you, if you hurt somebody, you can't unhurt them. You can help them to heal, but there's still this little bit 
of residual. No matter how hard you try, there's always going to be a residual hurt. You can't unbreak something. You can put it back together, but then there'll be glue. And maybe you can even do it beautifully with Japanese technique of laying in gold and making it more beautiful, but it will still have the crack that was there. And the story of Northern Thailand is that all of these little pieces of error gathered up and started to gather up to be so big that the that that people were starting to drown in these problems they were drowning as this pile of error grew larger and ever larger and one of the gods in this mythology one of the gods said i have an idea of what i can do to help humanity as i am a god and i am infinite i will sacrifice my own life which is meaningless to me as i am infinite i can continue so this infinite being this infinite god allowed that own god self to be um, killed as a way to undo all of the the errors all of the problems that were existent in the world and then in that way that God was able to help humanity with the problem of all these errors and bring these errors down to the right size so that the humanity wasn't <laughs> drowning any further. <laughs> Lovely <laughs> enough story. May I see a, a nod of a head or a shake of a... Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a sweet story that's told in Northern Thailand. Anyone have oh. any visceral reaction to the story? I mean, it's sweet. It's dear. It might not be our story, but... Well, it sounds like the Christian yeah. story. Or yeah, Christian. and that's that's exactly when I talked about people telling the story in Northern Thailand. It is a story told in Northern Thailand. It's a story told in Northern Thailand by the Christians who live in Northern Thailand. And it's a story, it's a, it, it's a retelling. And I want you to pay attention to what happens when, you, when the plot twist that I'm divulging happens. That it's the story, it's a, it's a version of the Jesus story, right? Jesus came, Jesus sacrificed Jesus' self to redeem humanity from all error, from all problems. And whether you, it, it's a different story when the name Jesus got attached to it, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, thank you, Emily, for for the auditory feedback. So it's that I different know. when you say it was a human that God became human, that Jesus is human. Yeah, it changes. It changes something around, and the point of what I uh, my what I was hoping to get with retelling this story, cloaked as I did, was to suggest that perhaps our baggage with some evangelicals, our baggage with the way that some people have used this story has gotten in our way and kept us from hearing this beauty that's in, that, that if it's a story that's told in Northern Thailand by people who we don't know, it doesn't have the same baggage. And so what no. I'm suggesting, sure. what I'm suggesting is <laughs> that it can still be a beautiful story um, and that maybe there is beauty in a story that we are so conditioned to not like mm -hmm. that it would be a shame for us to miss something. Mm -hmm. um, on Wednesday, I told the group who helped me to plan Saturday, I told them that I said, I'm going to ask the various ministers and, and ask people to share a story about Jesus. And I asked the Wednesday group, um, think about your favorite Jesus story. Hold on one second. Alex, can you find the source of that one? Okay, we got that one. Now, now that we've muted that microphone, let me go back. So one of one of my beloved people on Saturday said, "Well, I don't have a favorite Jesus story. I'm an atheist." And it it struck me as, "Well, that's a strange thing. You don't have to be, have any belief 
to have a favorite story that somebody uh, about someone and it and there was there was no no nothing a foul with what was said but i i want us to really be able to separate out and to say look there was this great teacher there was this great person and even if a story is ascribed to that person that's not something that they did there's still some learning that we can get clearly from retelling yes. that story and i thought today as it is <laughs> december 24th let's take a look at let's take a look at some jesus stories and i'm not Folks, I'm a rabbi. I'm not trying to convert anyone to any form of Christianity. Um, that would, that'd be odd. <laughs> Maybe we'll do that next yeah, week, but I'm not ready for doing that this week. <laughs> so that being said, um, Hugh, you had volunteered to, 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 uh, to do this with us. So Alex, would you be so kind as to pin Hugh along with me on the screen so I can change screens and get Hugh's focus up here. Thanks, Brian. Well, hold on one second, Hugh. I'm going to yep. try to get you and I together on the screen. Hmm. Alex, it's not working for me. There we go, about. Hugh. Oh, that's awful. I really messed up the visual. <laughs> Um, hold on one more second. Let me go back to, maybe that does it. Oh, you know, I haven't had this problem in so long that I forgot how to fix it. Shoot. If you have, uh, any epileptic tendencies, um, I apologize. Please do not watch the screen right now. Uh, that's the, oh, I don't know. Alex, you and I are going to have to troubleshoot this at a later point. There we go. I got you. There, it's just you, Hugh. I think I kind of preferred it when everybody else was on the screen with me. But <laughs> uh, Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Um, and I'm not here to, to convert <laughs> any, anyone either, just so everybody's, everybody knows that. That's not my, uh, that's not my style or intention. Um, but when Brian asked me to, um, to share a few thoughts, um, one of the things that I shared with Brian on telephone yesterday is that um, I, often, I often don't call myself Christian uh, because of the, the baggage that's associated with that term. Often when people use the word Christian, what they mean is, I believe certain things about Jesus, and, and I you know, believe he died for my sins, or believe this about Jesus, whatever. I avoid that that term. Um, uh, for me, what's important in in Jesus is trying to follow Jesus, and that's a very different um, perspective than believing certain things about Jesus. So I call myself, a, you know, I try to be a Jesus follower. That's how I. If I have to use a label, I don't like labels, but if I have to use a label, then I refer to myself as as a wannabe Jesus follower. Um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes. I'm, I'm grateful to Brian for this opportunity. I'm grateful to you for 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 listening. Um, when I when I think about Jesus, and one of the things that I've had to do over the years um, is unlearn many of the things that I grew up <laughs> with understanding about Jesus. I was I was fed a, a diet of very traditional theology, and I've had to untangle a lot of theology and um, and to relearn what, for me, what's important about who Jesus is. And in my mind, um, something I found helpful is a distinction uh, between the, the pre-Easter Jesus and the post-Easter Jesus. Um, the post-Easter Jesus is the Jesus that the church worships, um, is, is the, the, the Jesus that's really connected with, with, with God, the Jesus who is God in some mysterious way. That's one dimension of the, the church tradition around Jesus. You know, I know that's important to the church and in the lives of many people, but that's not what's important to me. To me, what's important is the pre-Easter Jesus, the Jesus who was human, the Jesus who lived and got hungry and was tempted and, you know, got uh, cold sores and lived, uh, lived a life. Now, he lived a really meaningful life. Um, I think Jesus was in touch with a deep wisdom um, and I can learn from, from that wisdom. Um, so I just needed to name that distinction between the pre and post Easter. 
Uh, and for me, I think when I think about the stories, there are so many stories of Jesus that I love. Um, I, I, I'm drawn to the stories where Jesus recognizes uh, the humanity in people whom society has written off. Mm. The, the, the lepers who are forced to live in a colony or, or the woman who'd had a bunch of husbands and was written off by the community. Those who, those who were ostracized from community, uh, Jesus found a really wonderful way of connecting with them, recognizing their humanity. And, and I think when I, when I say the word healing, um, that's different than cure. I think of healing in many ways as being restored to community, restored to relationship with, with people. Um, and, and therefore with the, 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 the mystery of spirit in, in, in the cosmos. And time after time after time, just open any gospel and you'll see stories where Jesus did this, um, where, where people would fight about law and how to interpret the law and what's correct and who, who's, in, who's in and who's out. Jesus came along and said, you know what? It's not about being correct. What's important is actually being in community. Mm-hmm. Community is more important than correctness. And where people drew, drew distinctions between insider and outsider or right or wrong or clean and profane, um, it's a very dualistic way of, of seeing the world. Uh, Jesus broke down that dualism. He had, a, he had a spirituality which rose above dualist thinking. And um, he saw, I believe, the, the sacredness in all of the cosmos, in all of the world, in all of the humanity, in all, all of the creatures of the world, including humans. He saw sacredness in all of those. It's not like some things are sacred and some are not. All things, all people um, have the God spirit in them, the Christ spirit in them, or whatever metaphor you want to use, the spark of life, the Buddha nature, whatever metaphor you use, there's sacredness in all of us. And Jesus saw that. And, uh, f- and for me, any ritual uh, of the church or any conversation or any teaching that I do in the church, um, it, tends to, it tends to lean towards this dimension of who Jesus is. And I'm continuing to learn uh, my life. Um, I've got a long way to go because there's times when I fall back into dualistic thinking and I like and I don't like this. I don't like that person or I disagree with that person and that affects our relationship. And then I think, well, wait a minute. Is that really what it's about? I need to remember continually. It's just this constant practice, this learning. And I got a long, long way to go. But uh, I, I fall back on Jesus and other wisdom teachers in the past. The Buddha has been a really important part of my life, too. And so have, so have writers and poets and artists and uh, people, people all throughout history, um, but Jesus is my my main go to because Thanks. that's my that's my mother tongue of spirituality. So I share that uh, that with you, um, just in a spirit of of love and openness and uh, and humility. And uh, thank you for thank taking you, the time Hugh. to listen. Thank you, Hugh. Mm-hmm. I love I love mm-hmm. that idea that we're always looking for the humanity in other people, right? And to to do that and to prioritize finding the humanity in others. What a wonderful story! What a wonderful lesson! Yeah. Amen. Let's have an amen. 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 And I'll ask. Um, I have a few other clergy people. I wanted to prioritize clergy folk. Um, if one of my other clergy folk friend who's here wants to share their favorite Jesus story or a lesson. And I'll pause and give you a moment to collect your thoughts if you want. And I'll tell you mine. One of my favorite stories about Jesus is when he loses his shit at the temple. (laughs) I fucking love that. Because... And in, in every biblical figure, there's humanity. And I love that even in this story of God incarnate, that being human is impossible to do without getting angry sometimes. And Jesus was at the temple and he's seeing the hypocrisy that's happening. And he feels so unable to fix it that he flips a fucking table over. And I just, 
I've felt that anger. I know what that feels like. We all have felt that anger. And I love that throughout the redactions of, 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 of history, that that story stayed in. It's not one that people always want to preach about, but I just love the idea that we, we all have permission to get angry. And also just a little historical, because nerd uh, footnote alert. Um, when Jesus says, you have taken, what have you done in my father's house? You've turned it into a den of thieves. That that's actually an allusion back to, oh my goodness, now I just lost it. Uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah says the same phrase when Jeremiah the prophet is um, yelling at the priests in the ancient days of, of how they're doing things wrong. Um, Jeremiah says, you've taken God's house and turned it into a den of thieves. And Jesus, the, the allusion back to Jeremiah that the anger is still there. So that that's that's this this rabbi's favorite Jesus story. Hmm. I don't want to call out other clergy folks who are on hand here, but I sure would love if you give me a wink, a nod, or a hand gesture or something, say you had something to share. But if not, really no pressure. I got other other stuff at the at the ready. Jack Jack has his hand up. Go for it. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you, Jack. Jack, do you have a favorite yeah. Jesus a story to share? Yeah. Um, well, it, it, it actually pertains to what the gentleman just talked about. And it, it goes to the core of what you're doing here. And that is going from the... Uh, overwhelming programming of religion into what I call the spiritual life. And it reminded me of a couplet from Hafez, the great Persian poet of the 6th century. The fire of religious zeal and hypocritical zeal will burn up the harvest of religion. And he admonishes to throw off the robes that you wear regarding religion and just go. Yeah. And when you go into the spiritual life, there are no surrogates between you and God. Amen. That's mm -hmm. what I wanted to say. Amen. I think that's a really important Amen. part, Jack. Thank you for reminding us that there's no, there's no intermediary, that this is the spiritual life. There's nothing else. There's nowhere else to go. We're doing this right now right here amen. can I get a another amen? Amen. 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 amen 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 thank thank you hallelujah chorus <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do we have a another another favorite Bruce go ahead oh uh, yeah when uh, Jesus was criticizing religious hypocrisy and stuff like that he used a phrase that actually indicates that he has sense of humor because he described religious hypocrisy as sitting out a gnat and swallowing a camel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like people that. pick out these little things, these little details that are meaningless, but then when it comes to swallowing a camel, it's no problem. It's, it's amazing. And I think we've all, we all have been seeing a lot of people doing that uh, publicly. <laughs> recently so it's lovely to know that this is this is not a new phenomenon yeah thank yeah. thank you thank you for sharing bruce do i have a, another volunteer i'm not Amen. able to see Amen. Ron, yeah ron just, go ahead i one of my favorites is the story of the good samaritan you know the idea that a person is just going along and gets beaten up and robbed and left beside this, left in the ditch. And the wise men, the lawyer, the priest all come by, look at him, and don't want to get involved. And finally, a Samaritan. A uh, person, a uh, a businessman of a spiritual group or 
tribal group that was despised comes along, sees him, packs him up on his uh, donkey, and takes him into an uh, inn, pays for him to be able to stay there, helps him get his wounds, and uh. then goes on his way. And the in then Jesus told this parable when he was asked of what do I need to do to have life, to inherit eternal life, I think was the words. And he tells the story and then he says, which of those three, which of those that came along do you think was a neighbor hmm. to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Mm -hmm. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Amen. So let me tell you about a time I experienced that parable in real life. I'm about 92, I think. I was in my, I had a sidecar rig with my uh, two-year-old son in the sidecar my wife behind me. We'd just been to a sidecar rally up in Yakima, Washington. We're hauling down the road. And another friend, uh, Mike Phillips, was there in his sidecar rig. And we passed these two bikers sitting by the road, trying hard to fix a bike using the tools that came with the motorcycles, which are never enough. And I looked over and I remembered that I had a full set of tools in the back. But you know, I just wanted to get home. I, if I got there, I had a two-year-old, he would, you know, I mean, it just wasn't gonna work. I didn't wanna get involved and so I headed home. We got back to Portland, pulled up and I told I made Mike started talking about how he wished he could have helped the people at the side of the road. And I said, yeah, I thought about it too. And I have all these tools, but I just wanted to get home. And he chewed me out, up one side and down the other. He says, you're not a real biker. Real bikers stop and help the people that are need, that need wow. help. Mm. And, oh, that stung so hard. I wanted to dig a hole in the ground and crawl in and pull the turf over on myself because Mike Phillips is a real biker. And I promised him that I would never do that again. Mm, that's and beautiful. He, he said, you know, okay, but every once in a while he'd see me. When he saw me, he'd say, are you helping people? And I'd say, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was there. That's beautiful, Ron. That experience that wow. made me realize that everyone is my neighbor. Amen. Amen. Amen to and that. I remember the words, go and do likewise. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you, Ron. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks. Yeah, that was not only a Jesus story, but it was a Jesus story this was this is a meta Jesus story because Jesus often talked in metaphors and then you took the Jesus story and you made it into a metaphor into your own doing. So that's that's double plus good. Thank you, Ron. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to share another um, another. There are three things, three moments that Jesus shared that um, I think are m often misunderstood. Jesus said, and it's a famous line of Jesus saying to turn the other cheek. Somebody strikes your right side, you should turn the other cheek and offer them your left as well. And Larry, my best buddy, has explained to me that and two other of Jesus's phrases that just, it, it's not easy to do. One is turn the other cheek. Somebody yells at you. I don't know, maybe a teenager who lives in your house who's upset, who... Maybe, I don't know, um, perhaps a teenager 
thought they gave you a gift to hold on to and now is demanding it back so that they can wrap it, but they never actually gave you the gift in the first place to hide from them. And it's about turning the other cheek, about saying, honey, I'm sorry, I, you didn't give it to me. Um, you can yell at me all you need, but it's not going to change the situation. It's turn the other cheek. And there were two other phrases Jesus used that are similar, which was one, he said, walk the second mile. Someone asked you to walk for a mile, walk the second mile. And that one requires a little bit of historicity to unpack. And let me tell you the historicity of it, which was that in Roman law, the Roman centurions carried packs of belongings. There's and they could ask, they were legally allowed to make anyone carry their shit for a mile. That was just Roman law. Like the policeman can say, hey, you, I need you to give me a jump start in my car. And you had to do it. So you had to carry a centurion's things for a mile. And so when Jesus says, walk the second mile, hold on to that, because I'm going to come back to it in a second was that Jesus also said, should somebody ask you for your overgarment, give them also your undergarment as well. And there, there's a subtlety to that one as well, which goes like this. Someone asks for your overgarment. If you give them that, you're left in your underwear. That's all right. But if you then also say, hey, you need my jacket so bad, take my underwear also, you're going to then be naked. And the thinking was, and go back to walk the second mile, was that if you started to carry the centurion's bags for a second mile, now the centurion's going to be in trouble because they're only allowed to make you carry it for one mile. And if you start carrying it for a second mile, the story's going to play out like this. You're going to start carrying the centurion's things for a second mile. And now the centurion's going to have to say something like, no, 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 please stop. I don't want to get in trouble. I just wanted you to carry it for a first mile. And then you say, no, 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 really don't worry about it. I'll continue to carry your, it's snide. It's really snarky. <laughs> and it's, it's making the centurion then beg you, please stop carrying my stuff. It's, oh, please, mister, let me help you out. And it's the same Larry explained to me for, um, if someone asked for your overcoat, if you give them your overcoat and your undergarment as well, they're going to have to be the ones who made you naked. And they're going to say, no, 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 no. I don't want your undergarments as well. I only wanted your overgarments. And you say, no, 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 I insist you. And you're making the other person look like an asshole. Oh, God, I forgot about that, did you? <laughs> it's a different way of looking at the story. And I, I kind of like it. Oscar Wilde said something, um, forgive your enemies. It completely confuses them. <laughs> oh, I think this is what Jesus was getting at of walk the second mile um, offer the other cheek and give them your undergarments as well this is just a, another Jesus-y story do I have someone else who would like to share a Jesus-y story or comments on the ones we've gotten go, go ahead I see Carol and then I heard a different voice at the same time Carol you go first would you I think that the most important part of a Jesus story is that he was born. I believe that the idea of a vulnerable child being born renews the world, gives you a sense of wonder, makes you realize that you are already rich, and all the things that are promised are already fulfilled in his just being born. When a new child is born, it shows that God hasn't given up on this world. And Amen. It also shows you your own creative potential. And I think that everything you need to know is already in the birth. Can we get an amen on that one as well? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That God has not given up on humanity because you were born. Wow. I love that. Kip, I saw your hand up there. Um, I deciding whether I want to share or not. I think I, I disagree with your, your view on those last, uh, the two stories a little bit. That's I fine. I don't think, That's... I don't like having a, an undertone of snark on them. Uh, and I think if you just think about it in a, in a, in a modern context, if, if Gandhi was teaching nonviolent resistance and everyone was sitting there being snarky and, and kind of chuckling to themselves about putting it over on the British, they'd all be dead. 
Mm. And, I, and I don't think encouraging that level of disingenuity is something that I like associating uh, fair uh, enough. with these teachings. Fair enough. Yeah, I think it's really more about understanding that you are safe at the most deepest level, no matter what's happening to you externally. Say a little bit but, more about that, would you? Well, I think that's, to me, that's what a lot of the Christian message is about. Yes, yeah. preach it. That ult ultimately, you know, God is loving you that much. Whether you we would have believed the context and, and the, the, the mythology or not, but that's what the story is. Even if yeah. you take it to the nth degree, um, and the, the story is that, is that God loves you and you cannot do wrong. Right. No matter what, God is going to be there with you, even in the worst of places where if you're killed by an imperialist uh, invader yeah. for doing nothing other than telling people to be nice, God's still going to be there with you. I, amen. And, and that goes with what Carol was just saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. That and what we talked about the other day is the other thing that I really, really love about this the story itself is is the part about Mary, where Mary completely signs up all in to become this vessel for this gift in the world at great risk to herself. Yeah. And as it's portrayed, you know, with very little hesitation, that level of surrender is, is beautiful. Right. Mm -hmm. And then just to go back on the story for a moment and help uh, to bolster what you're saying, Kip, is that Mary gets asked, will you birth love into the world knowing that what you are about to do is going to be fraught with pain? And this is, this is what sold me on Christmas when Jane explained to me this is what Christmas is about. It was about a, a young woman saying yes to God. A young woman saying, yes, I will allow myself to be used to birth more God into the world, even though it's going to break my heart. Amen. What a and, and potentially kill her outright in the society, being an unwed mother at that point. Correct. She was lined up for a stoning. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Kip. And, and Thank I, you. I appreciate that. Amen. Um, I do want to bring in something that I, I just was... So the difference of... of it is not a very... Native Jewish speakers know, not Jewish speakers, but if you were stewed in the same part of the stew where I grew up, was you can disagree with somebody's theology and you don't have to have the same creed as they do. And that there's a, there's a, there's some Christ, something happened to Christianity in the 300s or so where it became about creed, about what you believe. <laughs> and if you don't believe the exact same things, leave that church, start a new one, talk bad about the church you were just in. Mm. It yeah. might be an over yeah. oversimplification yeah. of it. Um, but I, I'm of a big tent feeling. And I, I grew I, I, I never knew that you'd get kicked out for having dissenting opinions. That was just, um, it's it's a very foreign idea to me. So I have, I, and so I appreciate Kip as, as you said that, and I love the fact that we can all, and that's part of religion outside the box, is that we can have different beliefs, but at the core of it, it's about kindness. It's about kindness to ourselves and to others, period. Okay. Amen. I got a little bit Amen. preachy there. Alma, <laughs> my dear. Hi, Alma. Hi, Alma. Hello. Hello. It's lovely to be back. Do you have me? you have a thing? Hold on. I'm trying to spotlight you so we can see you. You have a, a <laughs> Jesus story to tell us. Yes. It's, it, me, it, it's connected to you, actually. Do it. Um, well... I, I started look, looking at the Old Testament and well, the Hebrew scriptures and realized, it's all like an, a eureka moment, that no, nothing Jesus said was new. <laughs> it was all there. Yeah. Yes. And, that, and I thought, right, but having been brought up in the Church of England for all my life, um, we have this sort of, we're right, everybody else is wrong attitude, as you've just been saying. And I decided I wanted to find out more. And your name cropped up on Progressive Christianity. 
which is how I'm here now. And I actually also have your book, uh, This Rabbi This and rabbi, rabbi and That Rabbi, yes. Yeah, and it was an eye-opener. And since then, I, I'm amazed. I, as I read something in the in Hebrew Scriptures, and I think, my goodness, that's the story that Jesus told, or that's what Jesus says. Yeah. And then, um, at one point, I looked at the Lord's Prayer and Googled it, for quotations, and everything in the Lord's Prayer is taken directly from quotations in the Hebrew Scriptures. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we are we are very um, some uh, children of Abraham based, mm. and I think that we we do ourselves a disservice by um, thinking that we're better than everybody else. It, Which, it is unfortunately we do. It is a mm -hmm. very human thing that. Uh, we we do and uh, it is unfortunate indeed let let us let us try to be better than that yeah Thank the other you. thing too is that I, I i discovered to my absolute amazement that everything in the old in the hebrew scriptures of the old testament is not true it's it, not true in the fact that it actually happened correct it's 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 myth it's myth it's myth yeah. But they all, all those stories have have the um, a moral behind them and something to think about and something to help you grow spiritually. Right. And so let, then, let me add two things on what, what you're saying. One is that there's a difference between true and truth. It doesn't have to be a true story to be a truth story. And then some of you yes. might have noticed that Alma was catching herself in refraining from saying the Old Testament. And instead yeah. saying Hebrew Bible. <laughs> and that might seem picayune and like a small nothing of a thing, but it is it is important and it, it is meaningful to me. And let me explain why. When a Christian refers to the Old Testament, first of all, well, let me I'm gonna skip that. If you refer to it as an old testament, the it could have just been called a testament. But if you yes. put the old in front of testament, it then implies that there is a newer version as well. And so it is seen as a sign of respect to those who don't hold to the New Testament part to refer to what came previous to that as the Hebrew Bible, not as the Old Testament. So I just wanted to give you extra Amen. little thanks for, for that, that subtlety and to explain that out to people. Melissa, you have your hand up. Um, I know you're not on a, a, a video, uh, but what what is it you would like to add? And thank you so much, Alma. Lovely to see you. Lovely to be here. Melissa? Hello, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. Well, you asked us to share our favorite stories about Jesus. And um, I grew up in the church, and I think I heard all of them multiple times. But one of my favorite, favorite stories of Jesus was actually an ongoing one. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and Scribes were constantly trying to trap him, and um, one of those one of those examples, one of my favorite stories, is when there was a crippled man, who and his friends wanted to get him to Jesus, and they cut a hole in the roof because there were so many people around, and lowered this crippled man who could not walk down through the roof so that he could get to Jesus, and Jesus healed him. And um, he, he said, okay, you are well, um, take up your cot and walk. And the Pharisees were livid because Jesus told him to pick up his cot on the Sabbath. And, and he, res he responded, this just confirms, this confirms the hardness of your hearts. Here's a crippled man who has not walked in years and years and years and years and has to be carried everywhere he goes. And you're angry that he's walking and carrying his cot on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. It's you can. It, it's a wonderful story about missing the whole point. Mm -hmm. And I would ask us before we say, "Oh, that's something that they do." Let's take a little quickie moment and think about possibly is something that we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm that we all miss the point and get a little bit tied up on the details 
and we, we, we miss what was really going on. Everyone has a little, a little thing in their head of how you've done that recently. Amen. Okay. Amen. And can we all make it. a little bit of a resolution to, Hey, let's maybe not do that today so much. Okay. Alma had her hand up. I'm sorry, you're going to be sick of me by the end of the, in the afternoon, the morning, morning here. Um, I, I get rather cross when I hear my fellow Christians complaining about the Pharisees and putting them always, they're always the baddies, because they aren't. Mm. I mean, some of, some of Jesus' best friends were Pharisees, and right. really he makes that very plain. Uh, and also, they were questioners. And I wonder sometimes whether we've been mistranslating the questions. You know, why did mm. you do that? Tell yeah. me about it. What's the meaning behind it? Instead of, you shouldn't be doing that, which is completely <clears throat> different. It's, it's, it's us putting our perception on something mm. that was possibly not meant Right. In the way that we were taking it. We are so, so certain. We get so certain about this is what this is and this is why that was. And aren't I a victim to it? Individual mm -hmm. results may right. vary. Um, but we do get so stuck on that, don't we? So, so crazy. Okay. I'm going to take a pause here and just take a look back and see all of your faces. Hello, faces of people who are here. Um, I will say, I wasn't exactly sure how a Jesus-fueled service was going to go, um, but I feel all right right now, so that that's good. Um, and we're going to take a moment to move. Oh, we have lots of. I didn't even see. I have all these people who have been posting on on Facebook. And on YouTube, so hi to all of the people who are joining us afterwards on Facebook and YouTube. Who, hello late to the people who have been joining us on Facebook and YouTube. Um, thank you for making comments. And also, you guys are all welcome to, uh, if you go to the Religion Outside the Box page on Facebook, um, you can continue to chat and to do things there. Uh, Maria, do you have a list today? of people for whom we are adding prayers. Would you be so kind? Mm -hmm. um, this is the names uh, this week for lifting up and sending positive energy to Linda, Bruno, Joan, Irene, Joe, Ken, Armin and his family, Greta, Abbas, Doug, Loretta, Yola. If there is anyone else in our community that we can offer love and light to, please put their name in the chat and I will add them uh, to the list in the clubhouse. Great. And let's take a minute of time and we'll start that right here when we get to 40 seconds. Well, thank you all. Um, quick announcements. Oops, sorry, wrong screen. Quick announcements. There it is. Hey, it's winter. Hey, <laughs> you're human. It's hard. Life ain't easy. Not all the time. It's okay not to be okay. 
please remember that. Please share that with people. Please make space for people to not be okay. Don't force them to put on a smile. Listen to them. Uh, it can be uncomfortable to be around people who are sad, be around people who are angry. Let's try not to make them conform and be who they're not. It's okay to not be okay. Few, few other announcements. Um, show up early club. If you want to start with uh, Bob, thank you for starting us out earlier today. Uh, people are willing to show up at a half hour before the service. Please do. Here's just something I think is pretty important. Your bitterness hurts you more than anyone else. True fact. True fact. Yeah. Leave that there. Okay. Um, religion outside the box fundraising uh, season is not yet over. We're still trying to raise some more money. If you have not yet given or you have more to give, uh, please, the sustainability group and I all thank you so that we're able to make such wonderful programming as we are. And I think I... Sp and then anything next to him. And I got uh, a Fia. Hi, my friend. Do you have a Jesus thing you have? Well, I know I know the answer is like, because you and I text, but I know you have a Jesus thing that you wanted to share with everyone. It's like, hey, do you have a Jesus thing you want to share? Yeah, of course you do. Because I know that, because you and I talk. Uh, would you share with us uh, some, some le lesson or learning or teaching or something? Sure. Um, the first Jesus story that comes to mind for me is actually not in the traditional canon. It's in the infancy gospel of Thomas. Um, I lived and played a lot in books that didn't make it into the Bible that most people use in their traditional faith spaces. And in this story, Jesus is a kid. Wait, can we so time out there? I got to make sure everyone's on the same page. So all the books that are in the Bible are not all the books that are biblical. Like there were a lot of other books that were written at the same time. And then at some points people were like, nah, this one's not in the group. And, and just so you know how prevalent this is, the whole book of Maccabees, the book of Maccabees upon which Hanukkah is founded is not in the Hebrew Bible. So, so when she's talking about a story that's not in the Bible, don't go dismissing it if you also like Hanukkah. <laughs> Yeah, there's so many. There were so many stories written, and I mean scriptures written. I call them all sacred, um, but not all of them made it to like the headlines, you know. Um, so it's like indie films in the ancient world, I guess. Um, but in this story, Jesus is like 10, 11 years old, and he's playing with his friend on a roof, not to heal anyone. Um, but his friend falls off the roof and dies. And people accuse Jesus of pushing him down and, and killing him. And so this whole eruption happens and Jesus um, is arguing his point. I didn't push him. I didn't push him. I didn't push him. And eventually he gets sick of defending himself. And so he resurrects his friend and says, will you please tell him I didn't push you off the roof? And his friend's like, yeah, he didn't push me off the roof. But it's to me, it's a powerful story. What? Jesus has the ability to resurrect his friend the whole time, but he he goes through this debate for too long, and then it's finally like, Ugh, this is my man. Ugh, I'll just bring him back. He resurrects him and is like, can you just please defend me? And I, I think there's something in there for me about thinking about what power and tools you have at your discretion and being able to access them when you most need them. Mm. Like it probably would have behooved trial Jesus to just resurrect his friend from jump for a number of reasons. Um, but he didn't. He tried, you know, he went the hard way. Then went away. And I think there's something in there about to think about when it comes to the, the resources you have available at our that's, fingertips. That's a great story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing it. Just a, a question. How many of you had heard the story about Jesus pushing the guy off the roof? I had never. That was... He didn't, didn't push him off the roof. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't push him off the roof. They were playing. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you, Afia, for sharing. I have someone has their hand up, and I don't have a name with you, but go right ahead. Janet Rayner. Oh, hi, Janet. I know you. Hi. Um, so that little note you just put up about bitterness 
I think it was bitterness. Carrying bitterness hurt you more than. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. This one that I just said. I just said your bitterness hurts you more than it hurts anyone else. Right. Go ahead, Jen. I, all right. So I, you know, we talk about, Jesus talks about forgiveness. And one of the things, the hardest things I had to do was figure out forgiving the person who murdered my sister. Mm. And when I was interviewed by the paper, news, local newspaper, because they would do stories. She's been, it's been 30 years at this point. Um, they do stories every now and then. And it was probably... 12 years after she was killed, maybe less. And they said something about, you know, well, so have you forgiven? Because I said something about forgiveness. And I said, yeah, otherwise I'm carrying this. Right. The murderer isn't carrying this. I'm the one who's carrying this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And an aunt of mine read the article and she had been carrying bitterness about this person who got her son involved in drugs for years. And her son was in prison and she just had all this hatred and bitterness towards this person and told me that after reading the article, she figured out she had to let it go because it really was mm. hurting her. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wow. beautiful. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, forgiveness. That it, and, and all right, I'm going to I'm going to put a cherry on top of the whole thing with the Jesus story. Um, the very end, right? The very last scene before we get to post Easter Jesus. So the very end of Jesus's life is there's Jesus on the cross. And the last thing purportedly that Jesus says is forgive them. They know not what they do. Forgive them. They knew not what they did. We've, we've talked about forgiveness here. And what a beautiful thing it can be. And and we've talked about mistakes, and that we all make mistakes and that other people make mistakes and that we have to forgive them. Here's a thought I've just been playing with. And show of hands, how many of you hold yourself responsible to know the things that you do not know? I don't think I understand. Yeah, no, no. So let, let me try that again. How many of you think you should know the things you don't know? <laughs> I have a responsibility to learn the things I do. Right, 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 right. But are you responsible to know that which you don't know? And the answer is no, that's crazy. You cannot know what you don't know. Right. There's no way of knowing what that is. There's no way of knowing what that is. <laughs> and when we error, when we make mistakes, when they error, when they make mistakes, often it's because they did not know or we, they did not know what they could not know. And we could not know what we could not know. And there can be some forgiveness in there. It's a deep thought. It's a beautiful thing. Oh my goodness, I want to say thank you to each of you for showing up today. It's cold where most of us are. Let's find some warmth in our hearts. Let's find warmth in our hearts for each other. Find warmth in our hearts for other people. Other people can be really annoying. And let's, let's be as kind as we can to them and to ourselves. I'm going to thank you all. I'm going to stop the recording here. Um, we're going to continue on with the next.